What a perfect anthem out of the book of Daniel to sing this morning as we prepare for the text we're looking at. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, and we will pick up where we left off last week in this expose of an invisible cosmic war. I'm going to read the text for us again. I would love for you to look along. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And he gave birth to a son. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. We're going to pray and ask God's help as we study his word this morning. And I'm going to pray a a prayer that was prayed about 150 years ago uh, by a man preaching this text. And I will use his words to lead us this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray that our resumption of this study of this divine book may be fruitful. Not in curious speculation or intellectual gratification, but above and before all else in the quickening of our Christian vigilance and in the increase of our knowledge of God in his son. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You remember from last week that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But in the words of the Apostle Paul, it is against rulers and powers and the world forces of this darkness. Those are not human rulers and powers. They are what Paul calls the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You and I are involved in a cosmic war. The world in which we live is not what it seems. When we come to Revelation chapter 12, we get the curtain pulled back and we get to see what has been going on for all of human history. The chronology of the book of Revelation is interrupted. If you remember from chapter 11 and the end, we we conclude in verse 19 of chapter 11 uh, with the last trumpet judgment ready, the sanctuary of God in heaven opened, the Ark of the Covenant appearing, peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. And then the action stops all the way till chapter 15 and verse 5, where we pick up this statement. After these things I looked, and the sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels of the seven plagues came out. And so there is the resumption of the chronology, the narrative. Again, if you want to put a note in the margin of your Bible at the beginning of chapter 12, just note that the action picks up again in chapter 15, verse 5. And what do we have in between is, is something of a backstory. It is the subplot. And it is like a flashback and a flash forward. It is a behind the scenes look at what is not normally seen. We think in terms of what we can perceive. We think about nation states and and governments. We think about people. But what this text reveals for us is that there is a war we cannot see that has been waged for all of history. There is a past, a present, and a future to it. And so what we have in these three chapters is the subplot. They give us a a window into this warfare. And and the main idea of this text is a narrative interruption that provides the backstory on three significant players in the the end-of-the-world drama known as the Great Tribulation. 
I know that main point statement is a mouthful. The outline, if you remember from last week, is simple. We're looking at those three players. Uh, we, we see Israel and Satan and Jesus. These, of course, are the, are the first three that show up in this subplot. Later on, we will learn about the angels and their role during this time, the role of a remnant of believers. We will learn about beast one, that is the Antichrist, and beast two, that is the false prophet or the Antichrist right-hand man. And then when we get to chapter 17 through 19, we'll learn about another character, a woman who rides the beast. This is the worldwide apostate religion of the end times. Last week, we looked at that first character in this subplot, the woman Israel. And we discovered in verse 1, this was a sign in heaven, and the woman is a sign. In other words, this is not a literal woman. The, the text tells us that she is a symbol standing for something. And we discovered last week that this woman, as a symbol, stands for the nation of Israel. And we pick up in verse 3 with the sef- second character in the subplot. And here in verses 3 and 4, we see Satan. Look down at the text. <clears throat> Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, and his tail sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. This next character is introduced with the phrase, then I saw another sign. Another sign appeared in heaven. And a sign again is a symbol. And so when John reports that he sees a vision in heaven of a great red dragon, we are to understand that this symbol stands for a reality. In this case, a person. We're looking for the reality that the symbol represents, and we don't have to guess. We don't have to go very far to find out. This symbol is identified down in verse 9. Look down there. And the great red dragon, or the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now that portrays a, a future event we'll get to, Lord willing, next week. But, but very quickly, we see the identification. Uh, we don't have to go scrambling for, oh, what is this symbol symbolic of? The text simply tells us. This is none other than Satan. And if you believe that Satan is mythical or imaginary or like the, the, the character of a Gary Larson cartoon with a smile on his face... You need to understand that all of those mythologies are mythologies that Satan is happy about. He's, he's happy if people do not believe he exists. He's happy if people believe he is not a personal being. He's happy for people to believe that his hovel is a party for all your friends. He's, he's happy to believe for you to believe that he's an angel of light under the guise of religion and goodness and any other thing. He's happy to operate in the church But he is very real, and we have to come to Scripture and God's testimony to understand the reality behind the symbol. He is called the devil. Uh, That is a a word where we get our English word diabolical, and it means slanderer. He is called in this chapter the serpent of old, a reference to the serpent in Genesis 3. Satan was there, present in the garden, initiating the fall of mankind into sin. He is called in this text, Satan, and that word just means adversary or enemy. He is the enemy. Ephesians 2.2 calls him the prince of the power of the air. In John 12.31, Jesus actually called him the ruler of this world. In Luke 4, at the temptation of Christ, Satan came to Jesus and offered him the kingdoms of the world, which were at his disposal. He had authority to do that. Jesus acknowledges it. The the nations are in his grip. Paul calls him in 2 Corinthians 4.4, the God of this world. Small g God. We know there is only one true God. He is a a created being, but he is an imitator and and, and, and called the God of this world. 1 John 5.19 tells us the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 
2 Corinthians 11.14 tells us that he masquerades as an angel of light. And then as we heard this morning from Ben, Peter refers to him as a roaring lion, roaming the earth, prowling about the earth, seeking someone to devour. And notice this text describes him in the symbol as a dragon, a great red dragon. This is a large, intimidating, terrifying monster. Red here is the the color of fire and blood is reminiscent of hell's fire and the red blood of murder and of warfare. He is described here as having seven heads and ten horns. Can you imagine a a giant red seven-headed dragon with ten horns? This would be a terrifying scene just as a symbol in itself, a terrifying symbol. What are these things symbolic of? Well, we have help from God's word that actually details for us what these things represent. And we get help from Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. This is, this is what we studied a couple of years ago on Sunday nights. And, and you can go back and listen to the, the details there, particularly from Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, on what these elements of this fiery red dragon represent. But Daniel 2, and I, you can turn there. Daniel 2 details a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had. He was... Troubled by it, nobody could figure it out, but God's man in Babylon, Daniel, was given the interpretation from God for Nebuchadnezzar and for us. And unbeknownst to Nebuchadnezzar, his dream was a roadmap of world history that is accurate in its unbelievable prophetic precision and is not done yet. Look down at Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. Daniel describes the dream and explains it. He says, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great image. That image, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was rising up in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that image was made of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. And you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed all at the same time. And they became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What is Daniel describing there? He he explains the dream in the subsequent explanation and the top of the statue in gold is the Babylonian empire, this great world empire with Nebuchadnezzar at the head. But in order to remind Nebuchadnezzar that he is nothing except a sub-regent under the sovereign king of the universe who's orchestrating history, Daniel lets him know that your kingdom is short-lived and you're going to die. Another kingdom's coming after you. Another world empire. And it is the Medo-Persians. And following that is the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. And under that is the Roman Empire. And after that is a a future revived Roman Empire. We might call Rome 2.0. And after that is another dominion which comes and smashes all of sinful, rebellious humanities, governments, and empires and replaces them with a worldwide dominion belonging to none other than Messiah. So that's Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's interpretation of it. And when you get to Daniel chapter 7, you essentially get the same world history rehearsed in another vision. And this is the vision to Daniel of the beasts representing successive empires from Daniel's day forward. And the first beast is a a winged lion representing Babylon, followed by a bear with the ribs in its mouth, the the Persians, the Medo-Persian empire. And then a fleet-footed, four-headed leopard representing Greece. And and if you remember the details of these things, the the description of the statues and their materials and the description of the beasts in their characterizations, 
fit precisely with the world empires that came after Daniel. Such that the the modern critics of Daniel who read Daniel's book and look back on the the Babylonians, the Grecians, the Medo-Persians, and the Romans, and they say, oh, it's too perfect. Daniel had to write it after all of those. It's, It's so good as history, written before history happened, that people say, oh, you, Daniel can't be in the Bible. Somebody wrote it later. Of course, that can't be supported by any evidence inside or outside of Daniel. He clearly is writing under the hand of God as prophetic look toward history. And it is supremely precise. Following the Grecian Empire, that four-headed leopard is followed by a crushing monster with iron teeth. That's Rome. And then Rome is followed by another iteration of Rome, the ten-horned beast. And when you take these five empires, and, and you think about two empires that came before Daniel's day, that were Satan's proxies of God of his battle against God's people, we would think of Egypt and Assyria. When you line up all the world empires that aligned themselves against Israel, you have Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Rome revived. That's seven. That's where we get this picture in Revelation 12 of a seven-headed dragon. What's depicted here is that Satan is behind these world empires who have been antagonistic to God's plan for redemptive history. They've been antagonistic to God's people. These empires have had in their crosshairs the destruction of Israel. They've been at war with Israel. They have assaulted Israel, taken Israel captive. And according to Daniel, the the last of these seven heads, Rome 2.0, has ten horns. That is, ten symbols of power. A a horn in the Bible is a symbol of strength, like the horn on an animal. And so the the horn of salvation or the, the horn of government is a description of strength, often military might. In fact, when we get to Revelation chapter 13, we're going to see a beast coming out of the sea. That's a symbol of the Antichrist. He's a man, and that Antichrist comes with the ten horns and the seven heads. That is, he comes with a a temporary worldwide dominion, that's the revived Roman Empire, given to him by Satan. Satan's behind it invisibly, but a man will come who will visibly govern over this thing. A ten-nation confederacy, ten horns. And both Daniel and Revelation describe Antichrist's Machiavellian machinations, his, his intrigue and his government where he plucks up three of the horns and replaces them and takes over everything. Eventually gets the whole world to bow to him. This, of course, is temporary in the future. But behind it is the scheming of Satan, the kind of scheming that has been going on for all of history. This last ten-nation confederacy that Daniel taught us about will dominate the globe in the last days of man's rebellion against God. The Antichrist will be a man on the earth. In fact, if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, the text from which we just sang. Looking down at verse 7. Daniel writes, I kept looking in the night visions and behold the fourth beast, fearsome and terrifying and extraordinarily strong. It had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. Right? That sounds just like the last part of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. It matches the last beast. It was different from all the beasts that were before and it had 10 horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and speaking great boasts. Look down at verse 23. That fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, different than all the other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. 
As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will rise, another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones, and he will make low three kings. He will speak words against the Most High, he will wear down the saints of the Highest One, he will intend to make changes in seasons and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. When we studied Daniel, we looked at that time, times, and half a time. One time plus two times plus a half a time is three and a half times. That equals the three and a half years we'll see later this morning. This is the period Revelation is talking about, that Daniel talked about. The court will sit for judgment, verse 26. His dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. And then the reign, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. This is where all of human history is inexorably rushing toward. There will be the darkest days humanity has ever known followed by the brightest and most peaceful for a thousand years leading into an eternal state of glory. Who's behind this rebellion? It is Satan. He is described having the seven heads and ten horns, just as the Antichrist who represents him visibly on the earth will have the same And notice, the text tells us, on his head were seven diadems. End of verse 3. A diadem is a crown. And there are two words for crown in the New Testament. One is the laurel wreath, usually made out of of branches and leaves. It was given for victories in war and victories in athletics. The diadem, however, is the crown of royalty. Uh, This is the crown of of sovereign rule. It was made of gold and, and precious jewels. The word diadem shows up three times in the book of Revelation. In chapter 12, verse 3, right here, it is on the dragon. In chapter 13, verse 1, it is on the head of the beast, the Antichrist. And the only other place it shows up is in chapter 9 and verse 12, where the diadem sits on the head of the rider on the white horse. That is the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back in his victory. Jesus is the only one who is the rightful wearer of that crown of royal reign over the whole earth. But what comes before Christ? The Antichrist. And what is behind the Antichrist? The great arch enemy of all of humanity. And what are they doing? Audaciously characterizing the tops of their heads with the diadem. Satan is the great imitator. The beast... The Antichrist is an imitator. That's why he's called the Antichrist. People will think he is the Messiah, even though he is Messiah's exact opposite. Everything Jesus isn't, he is, and vice versa. And the second beast, the false prophet, the right hand of the Antichrist, he also is an imitator. He is said in chapter 13 to have two horns like a lamb, speaking like a dragon. Do you catch that? Even the way he's portrayed is Jesus-like in appearance. But with the words, the message, the malevolence of Satan. Look how Satan is described in verse 4. And his tail sweeps away a third of the stars. There is a present tense here in the original. And it's supposed to draw us into this activity that he did. We're, we're supposed to feel it. Like the way we tell a story. I said, so I was go- I'm going to the store and I'm buying some stuff. We say it in the present tense to get people into the story. That does that right here. We're to see this activity of Satan sweeping away a third of the stars. He has a, a plan And he has conscripted help for that plan. There are a couple of options for understanding the third of the stars in heaven that were then thrown to the earth. Uh, Some have said these stars are people. They are persecuted saints on the earth that, that Satan is harassing. But the second view, and I think the right view, is to see these as angels. Revelation 9.1 calls angels stars. Job 38.7 calls the angels as heavenly stars. 
And if that be the case here, this is the text that tells us that Satan took a third of the angels. Remember in the beginning of creation, God created everything and said it was good. Satan was good. The angels were good. Satan defected and rebelled and took with him a third of the angels. They followed him in his rebellion. What do we call these fallen angels biblically? They are demons. Real, personal, spiritual beings that follow Satan and are conscripted into his service. And you remember in the sixth trumpet judgment in chapter 9, there was a, a demonic horde of some 200 million demon cavalry who have come out for battle. And then before that, you had the demon locust hordes in the fifth trumpet in chapter 9 that come out of the pit. In addition to those demons, there are the demons who are not imprisoned, who roam the earth currently, who deceive the world, and they torment humanity. This is a massive population of evil spiritual beings. How many on the, are there? Well, if we do a little math and we go back to Revelation 4 and 5 in the throne room scene of all the angels, there of the good angels, John said there were myriads and myriads plus thousands times thousands. And at the bare minimum, minimum, myriads times myriads plus thousands times thousands equals 404 million good angels. A third of those would be about 200 million bad angels. But I think the, the use of the biggest number in Greek multiplied by the biggest number in Greek, both in plural, plus add some other thousands multiplied by thousands, probably indicates there are more than 404 million good angels and that there are therefore more than 202 or whatever a third of 404 is. Oh, I thought I had the math. It didn't go there. A third of that. There, there's a lot of demons. There are a lot of conscripted agents of this invisible war that are active. And just so we get our angelology and demonology straight, they have existed since the beginning of the universe. They've been there since the first week of creation. These are not generations of demons. They are eternal beings. They administrate and execute Satan's war against God and humanity. This is a serious war that we are in. Notice how Satan is described. The dragon stands before the woman who is about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. This is a monstrous image. A giant, fiery red, evil monster just waiting for the arrival of a baby so that he can devour the child. What is Satan up to here? He, he wants to eliminate the threat. What? What baby could possibly be a threat to this malevolent beast who's the god of this world, who's the prince of the power of the air, who has the whole world in his grip, who blinds the minds of unbelievers, who is called the god of this world? We might immediately think in this symbol of Bethlehem, when did Satan stand before Israel waiting for Israel to give birth to some child? And of course, we'd be right to think about Christmas here. Through his proxy, Herod, Satan sought to murder Messiah. And the text here is best translated, not stood, he, he stood there waiting, but but he stands waiting, or he has stood waiting before the woman. It's very clear in the original text that the, the verb tense here is not just one event. But this is something Satan has been standing for for a long time. Satan has been opposed to Israel, Israel as the woman who would bring about Messiah, for her whole history. And, and Israel, as you know, is about 4,000 years old. This monster standing before her, waiting for the promised one with murderous intent all along, is culminated at Bethlehem when Messiah actually appears. And he seeks to have all the baby boys in town murdered to eliminate him. 
This murderous intent even predates Israel, goes back farther than 4,000 years, going back to the very first woman. In fact, let's just consider for a few moments the career of Satan. One has said it this way in summary. He seduces and misleads the whole world, promising good and peace, only that he may the more effectually entrap and ruin. Satan is a deceiver. He doesn't win a lot of adherence by saying, I'm Satan. I'm your enemy. I'm God's enemy. Everything that's good, I'm opposed to it. Uh, Come along with me and we'll be on a highway to hell. A few people fall for that and sing about it, but, but most people aren't taken by Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan and backwards Bibles and 666 tattoos. The world is rather deceived by this angel of light parading goodness and beauty and peace and promises. But make no mistake, he is a murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44. He murdered humanity in the garden. Here's Paul's statement about that murder. Romans 5, 12. Just as through one man, that's Adam, the first man. Just as through one man, sin entered the world. And what came with it? Death entered through sin. And so death spread to all men. Now every human being after Adam is born dead spiritually. On account of that, everybody sins. How did sin get here? How did death get here? Well, we get that backstory in Genesis 3. You can turn there in your Bibles. Genesis 3. We get this story of that serpent of old. Beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. And that serpent said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? At the very beginning, his first entrance into the world, his first line on the great drama of human history is an undermining of God's word. He's changing up what God told her. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. I think we begin to see the woman's confusion because of the lies being told already in verse 3. The serpent said to the woman outright, you surely shall not die. Now this is a bold-faced, blatant disregard of God and a claim that God is a liar and this talking serpent is here to tell the truth. And what does he say the truth is? God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. God doesn't want you to be at his level. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate, and we all died. This was murder. On a grand scale of all humanity. From the one who is called the murderer from the beginning. Down the page, verse 13. Yahweh God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. There's the smoking gun. Genesis 3.15. Notice this promise. We, We call this the the proto-gospel, the the, the first iteration of the good news of Jesus Christ's death at Calvary. And and, And it's spoken to Satan. Did you notice this? God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush you on the head and you'll crush him on the heel. I'm not going to ask you to put yourself in Satan's shoes. But Satan is hearing these words about a solution to the problem he just made, about life for a murdered race. And it is a direct threat to him. God says to the snake, you deceived the woman, you killed humanity, 
and you're going to be crushed. How? By a seed of the woman. Up to this point in the biblical history, what do we know about seeds? We've been told in the first couple of chapters that trees have fruit with seed in them that produce trees that have the same fruit that have seed in them. What is a seed? It's a, it's a line of descent that produces the same kind of thing. And, and God made man and woman in his image. Man and woman will then have seed descendants who are image bearers. They're still made in the image of God. And they are descent of the man and the woman They will inherit a sin nature, but they also become the placeholder for a promise that God would crush the snake. What would Satan's response be to such a promise? They can't have seed. They better not have any descendants. The woman better not have a son. And so what does Satan do? She, She, of course, bears Cain. And I think she thinks Cain's the answer to the problem. Of course, Cain's not. Satan incites Cain to murder his brother Abel. So the first two potential seed promise fulfillments, one's dead and the other's a murderer. Just like the father of all murderers. In fact, Cain lies about it. Cain, where's your brother? I don't know. And the very first descent of the woman on the seed is imitating the murderer and liar behind the scenes. And what flows out of Genesis 4? It's the spread of evil, murder, vengeance, violence, polygamy. They're all there in the first generations of humanity's walk on the earth. And then, of course, in Genesis 5, you have the the spread of death. Flip over a page to Genesis 5 and, and just scan this list. It's a, it's a genealogy. So-and-so begat so-and-so type of thing. But verse 5, Adam lived and he died. Verse 8, Seth lived and he died. Enosh and he died. Kenan and he died. Mahalalel, he died. Jared died. Methuselah died. Lamech died. This is the table of death. And it is the tangible, historical fulfillment of what God said. You eat of this fruit, you're going to die. Death entered through one man, spread to all men. Everybody sins, everybody dies. And yet, there are descent. People are being born. This has to be a frustration to Satan. What does Satan do in the next chapter? Chapter 6, he He tried to murder humanity in the beginning in totality. Maybe God will just reject them, uh, just be done with it. If I take out Cain and Abel, they can't have descent. But God allowed Adam and Eve to produce, and they produced, and they produced, and humanity is filling the earth. What does Satan do? In Genesis 6, he injects demonic descent into the seed line of humanity. If I can't stamp them out, I'll breed them out. That's his plan. Can he make the human race so corrupt with this evil, demonic half-breed that God will reject them completely? Make the race unsavable. Thankfully, God did not allow Satan to do that throughout human history. When you get to Genesis chapter 11, Satan is at it again. God said, fill the earth, subdue the creation, glorify me by filling creation with image bearers. And humanity said, nope, we're going to come together, make a name for ourselves, build a tower. God squashed it, and then he made a people for himself in Genesis 12 through Abram. And there we get the promises again in Genesis 12. The seed promise now comes through a man and a family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. Jacob is renamed Israel, has the 12 sons, they're the 12 tribes. One of those tribes is Judah, and the seed line for the the hope that will crush the snake now comes through Judah, and that gets funneled through one of Judah's descendants named David. 2 Samuel 7 makes the promise. Here's where the seed line is going through. It's going through David. And you think about Israel's history, Satan's attack has tracked the promises Who else has been in the crosshairs of Satan's ire 
than the nation of Israel and Abraham's descent. For all of their 4,000 years history, they've been in the crosshairs of his animus. In Egypt, of course, Satan provoked Pharaoh to try to attempt to kill all the baby boys. Leaving Egypt, uh, Israel was hemmed in by Pharaoh's army and would have been brought to destruction, but God rescued them. And then you have this king named Balak and a, and, a, and a mercenary prophet named Balaam. He's a false prophet, but God made him speak true things. And Balak hired Balaam to try to eradicate Israel through divine curses. And when that didn't work, when he, when he couldn't get God to curse Israel, he put a stumbling block in front of Israel through sexual temptation, and, and they fell for it, and And of course, many in Israel are cut off as a result, but God maintains his promise and maintains the seed line. And throughout Israel's history is the constant threat of extermination during the conquest and and the time of the judges. In 2 Samuel 7, that seed line was promised through David, but David himself as a placeholder for God's promise for the coming Messiah that would crush the snake David was threatened by the Philistines. He was threatened by his father-in-law, Saul. He was threatened by his own son, Absalom. And twice in the history of David's descent, the Davidic line came down to one male who was smuggled away to safety when all the other seed line was destroyed. And then, of course, in subsequent history, there were attempts to wipe out the Jews through the successive world empires. Assyria and Babylon, then Greece and Rome, all took their turns in different ways to try to wipe out Israel, to take Israel off the map and remove Israel from the memory of human history. Greece did it a little bit differently. They tried to Greekify the Jews. Uh, they put up uh, gymnasiums and entertainment houses and and they tried to Greek culture the Jews so they were no longer Jewish by any stretch of the imagination. The other empires just tried to wipe them out militarily, ending with Rome. Satan has been behind all of this, that serpent, through the temptations of idolatrous religions of the surrounding nations to pollute Israel's theology, to dislodge her loyalties from Yahweh, to disqualify her from bringing Messiah into the world. The great red dragon has stood before her throughout her history. In fact, ever since Genesis 3.15, Satan has plotted and schemed in many different ways to prevent the promised one from ever coming onto the world stage. This world is not as it seems. We think about nation states and and races of people in various places, political rivalries, wars of empires, many different religions competing for truth claims, or maybe joining each other in an impossible truthlessness claim. But the reality behind all the scenes is this invisible cosmic war, and there are only two sides. There is one race of people, the human race, and every human is on one side or the other. The side of Yahweh, the one true God, the almighty maker of heaven and earth, or the side of that great imitator, the liar, the murderer of humanity, the great enemy of God. As creatures made in God's image, we were created to give him and him alone honor and glory that he is due. We were actually created by God to be lords of the earth, subduing creation for his purpose and filling the earth with his image. But now the image of God in humanity is marred beyond recognition. We are all born slaves, enlisted in a slave army by that enemy, the usurper, the pretender. This pretender, this malevolent imitator, has been in a war with God and his people for all of human history. I want to quote an older scholar a little bit at length here. He describes Satan this way. He is a mimic God, a creature. Not at all beyond Almighty's government and control, but one of the sublimest of angelic beings, a prince among the celestial hierarchies, set against God, seeking to overturn heaven, aiming to supplant the kingdom, authority, and rightful worship of the great eternal, himself grasping for the reins of universal sovereignty. We tremble as we think of the awful daring. 
the ambition and adventure of earthly despots in setting out to conquer this world. You could think Alexander the Great. You could think of Hitler. You could think of Pol Pot and Stalin. History calls them great men. Yet here is a being who has adventured upon the exploit of conquering the universe, of wresting creation from its maker. Principality after principality in the celestial realms succumbed and fell in line beneath his banner. A third of the very stars of heaven joined his cause and followed his train. God's appointed lords of the earth, he's talking there about us humans, were betrayed into his power. And so there now exists a mighty confederation of evil made up of angels and men, disembodied and in the flesh, numbering millions upon millions of disloyal spirits who overspread the planet with disorders, anarchy, misrule, darkness, gloom, sorrow, death, and 10,000 embitterments of existence from which uncounted creatures sigh and groan and cry to be delivered. And Satan hates the one who came to deliver us. He set up his entire career trying to stop the Genesis 3.15 promise. He did that at Bethlehem. Hounded Jesus in his earthly ministry. And persecutes his followers. That leads us to the third character in this text. And it is Jesus himself. We find him in verses 5 and 6. Look down there with me. And she, the woman, gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman Israel brought forth Messiah. This Messiah is no ordinary man. He's not from around here. He is the son of God. He is the son of man. He is the God man. He has always been. He has eternally existed. And he came to earth. He is a descendant of David according to the flesh. He is the child of promise. This is the one Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 9, 6. We, we sing this when we sing Handel's Messiah. <clears throat> a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of armies will accomplish this. And Isaiah promises that this son born is the fulfillment of those two visions. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, to be a kingdom that replaces all others in righteousness and peace that never ends. The fulfillment of the Genesis 3.15 promise to Satan in the presence of that first woman is fulfilled in none other than Jesus. And notice what the text says about him in Revelation 12.5. He is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. His rule and reign is not going to be secret, merely in the hearts of his followers. It will be visible and manifest on the earth from the throne of David. Notice what the text says, over all the nations. And it literally says he is about to rule. That is, from John's day, in about AD 95, he wasn't ruling in this way yet. Still future. And in this context, in Revelation 12, the, the backstory to what's called the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years of man's days in rebellion on the earth... It's still future. And these verb tenses in this verse are so important. He's not currently ruling, although Jesus as King of Kings is the sovereign one over the universe. He's ruling in a universal and absolute sense. The only way in which Satan is the ruler of this world is by being on a short leash under the kingly sovereignty of Almighty God. He can only go as far as God allows. But there is a future, manifest, visible, physical reign which will belong to Jesus. It is future and inevitable and imminent. That's what's bound up in this idea of he is about to rule. It's not happening yet, but it will happen and it's imminent. It's about to happen. 
That is, it's close. We, we ought to feel history rushing toward this. And all of this means the victory is assured. No one but Jesus could break the curse, free the slaves, forgive the sin, crush the snake. And Jesus goes about this work in such a remarkable way. Two visits. Two visits. Two advents. The, the, the Christmas arrival of Messiah. And then the victorious entrance on a white horse in Revelation 19. He is the suffering servant and the returning king. He is the lion of Judah and he is the lamb slain. How does Jesus go about crushing the snake? Solving the sin problem by his substitutionary death on the cross for everyone who would believe. And then solving the problem of that pretender usurper, the God of this world. By having victory over him in a, in a military way at the end. Satan's plot to betray and kill Jesus actually worked. He got on the inside with Judas. I mean, one, one of the 12 close followers with Jesus. One who was there at the, the Last Supper. The text tells us that Satan actually indwelt Judas. And, and, and Judas didn't grow horns and hold a pitchfork. In fact, the disciples at the table were confused about who it was that would betray him. He looked like a follower of Jesus. Satan got in to betray and then to kill Messiah. And, and of course, this, this plan was successful. And it is the biggest backfire in history. In the most beautiful world-altering irony, Satan's relentless ambition to kill the seed of the woman brought about the very crushing blow he was striving to prevent. And none but Jesus could disarm, dislodge, dethrone, defang, and defeat the so-called God of this world, that serpent of old, the slanderer, the adversary. But the Word of God, the Word made flesh, felled him. <laughs> Notice what the text says. Her, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now we've gone from the imminent future back to past tense. This is a, a reference to Jesus being caught up after his resurrection. It's the same word that's used for the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4. Here is a reference to the ascension. After he rose from the dead in front of his disciples, he went up into the clouds of heaven. And notice Jesus is caught up to the throne of God. The throne of God in heaven, the throne of his father. He, he does not yet sit on his own glorious throne to rule the nations. That's not the throne of David. That's still yet future. But he is at the throne of his father at the right hand of majesty where he makes intercession for believers. He's our faithful high priest and our advocate, our propitiation. And so what do you have in verse 5? You have the pastime incarnation, the imminent future dominion, and the pastime ascension of Jesus the Messiah. And this backstory is so important for us. In verse 6, you, we go back to the woman. She fled into the wilderness, had a place prepared by God, so she'd be nourished for 1,260 days. These 1,260 days co-align with the Time, times, and half a time that we just read in the book of Daniel, the, the three and a half times, or as described in Revelation 11 and 12 and 13, three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, all the same time frame. That is the period called the Great Tribulation, the last half of Daniel's seventh seven. And this is the period where Antichrist will be revealed. He will uh, seek to tread the whole earth under his foot. He will have made an agreement with Israel for a time and then break the agreement, enter the temple, and demand to be worshipped as the, as the Messiah of the new world religion. What this verse, verse 6 describes for us is at that time, uh, the time called the abomination of desolation, Israel as a nation will receive supernatural protection as they flee into the wilderness. Scott Demarus took us through this in Zechariah. Jesus describes it in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation that Daniel wrote about, flee. Don't go down from your rooftops to get your family pictures and your wallet and all your other stuff. Run. And God promises a protection for the 1260 days. We'll get to more of that during the tribulation period in our study. This is the time called Jacob's trouble. Its purpose is to refine Israel. 
and to bring Israel to repentance so that in that final day, they will believe in Messiah as a nation. All of this in keeping with God's promises to them. Between verses 5 and 6, there is white space. Uh, Not that we would put more words in the Bible, but there is a time gap between verses 5 and 6. That time gap is church history. The the first followers of Jesus who were persecuted by the Jews and and their successors who were persecuted by the Roman Empire and and then the followers after them who were persecuted by the medieval church and then those who are persecuted by false religions and governments all over the world today. It's pretty easy for us to be disciples of Jesus here now. Maybe not forever. It might get harder for us in America. But most people who have followed Jesus throughout history and in the world today and other places face the hardships that have Satan behind the whole thing. He is still going after the seed. Interestingly, we are called Abraham's seed by faith, not by genetics. And Satan is a a lion roaming the earth, seeking people to devour. Satan's behind the war. Even the war that we face now that is invisible, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the spiritual wickedness. Satan has attempted persecuting the church. Let me just stamp it out in its first iteration. Let me take all the Christians like Stephen and and have them stoned in public and then everybody be afraid and run away. Let me take the Christians and and light them up in Nero's garden as as human torches for entertainment. Uh, Let us feed them to the lions in the Colosseum and, and nobody will follow Christ. And the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church and the church grew under persecution. Well, if you can't beat them, join them, says Satan. So then the Roman Empire becomes a Christian empire and dilutes the message, pollutes the scriptures, and loses the gospel and eventually buries the Bible. And the medieval church is the inheritor of the Roman Empire and then actually persecutes the true church. And this pattern continues. There are places where the church is persecuted and there are places where the church is infiltrated. Think about the landscape of evangelicalism today. There there are many phony gospels, shallow gospels, false gospels, no gospels. People that come to church and dress up nice and, and they hear somebody up front saying something and it's not God's word and it's not the saving message of Jesus Christ. But people feel good, go in there, listen to it. I did my church thing, check off the box. And they're on that highway to hell with Satan at the helm. If you can't beat him, join him. This invisible war is serious and the stakes are high, but the victory is assured. Do you remember Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 18? I will build my church, he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Satan's craft and power are great and he is armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal, but Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is to you we sing, you are the king. You are the rightful inheritor of this, your earth. And one day you will return and you will remove the usurper, the great imitator, the enemy, the adversary, the diabolical fiend, the murderer and liar. And with him you will remove all those who have followed him who were born enslaved as agents of that great conspiracy. And we think about that day when you return and set everything right, that we were once those on the wrong side and you were so kind in your grace to save us. And God, as long as you give us breath on this earth, I pray that you would make us your agents, enlist us, conscript us in your army, to take the message of your grace and love and rescue to all who who will hear. And would you be pleased to draw many to yourself through this message of your gospel. And we sing now your great victory in your name. Amen.